Presenting information, stories, and experiences are key to understanding the story of a dark time in our nation's history and making sure that the mistakes of the past never occur again. Beginning in 1951, the era of nuclear weapons testing was a time of tremendous change at both national and local levels. In the name of national security, a variety of nuclear weapons were tested in a remote area of the Nevada desert, known as the Nevada Test Site. Fallout and radiation from these tests have affected communities across the nation, in many cases resulting in the loss of property, health, and life. The Downwinders of Utah Archive presents an in-depth study of the nuclear detonations, radioactive fallout, and events which have resulted in devastating effects for Utah's downwinder population. Through the presentation of an interactive timeline, detailed information on each atmospheric nuclear test conducted at the Nevada test site found to produce off-site radioactivity is presented, as well as fallout statistics for all Utah counties geospatially visualized based on raw data and presented through cartographic maps, animated reconstruction models, interactive motion charts, and a variety of graphics related to testing methods, cloud heights, and dispersal patterns. The archive also presents historical photographs and videos of nuclear detonation tests being conducted, archived newspaper articles, and documents that depict the impacts and deception imparted to residents, as well as oral history interviews from a few of Utah's surviving downwinders. Through the Downwinders of Utah Archive, viewers are able to examine the contained information and utilize it within educational and research endeavors. The searchable timeline allows for easy access to time-specific data, visualizations, and information on demand. Each component presents detailed information regarding each event, as demonstrated in this example, presenting information on the test name, date, time, device type, yield, atmospheric release of iodine-131, a nuclear byproduct focused on throughout the Downwinders of Utah archive, and much more. Photographs and videos captured for each event are included to provide viewers with a real-world depiction of each event while incorporating satellite imagery and three-dimensional visual models of individual test sites as a frame of reference and a representation of how each testing location appears today. In this video example depicting a nuclear detonation test being conducted, you are viewing the first and only test conducted using the atomic cannon conducted on May 25, 1953 in an event later known as Operation Upshot Knothole Test Grable. One of the primary features of the Downwinders of Utah archive is the visualization of nuclear fallout events. In particular, the examination of iodine-131 ground deposits for all counties throughout Utah. Iodine-131 being one of the many nuclear byproducts produced during a nuclear detonation and found to be associated with thyroid cancer. Scientists have found that following a detonation, nuclear sediment is lifted high into the atmosphere and carried away from the testing site by wind currents, where it later falls back to the Earth's surface, generally over pastures and populated areas. In addition to general fallout exposure, the sediment deposits attach themselves to the grazing materials of cows and sheep, whose milk was highly consumed and utilized by local farmers and populations of the day. To examine the extent of this fallout among Utah downwinders, geospatial visualizations have been created to examine and interpret raw data statistics in ways previously unavailable. Geospatial visualizations such as these are made openly available to viewers by individual detonations, test series summaries, and a complete visualization for all iodine-131 recorded throughout Utah. Currently, raw data published through the National Cancer Institute shows that nuclear test detonations conducted at the Nevada test site released a total of 156,536 kilocuries of iodine-131 into the atmosphere, resulting in 590,082 nanocuries of iodine-131 sediment returning to the Earth's surface and distributed throughout all parts of Utah.
Detonation reconstruction animations are intended to portray the setup, detonation, and aftermath of each type of nuclear test. Each testing method was extensively researched and subsequently reconstructed using data from the U.S. Department of Energy, as well as aircraft and device specifications from Boeing and Wikipedia. These detonation reconstruction animations are available in both two- and three-dimensional formats. Historic photos of aircraft, atomic guns, and nuclear devices were used as a reference when modeling each animation to ensure the maximum possible resemblance and realism. All animations include annotations throughout the course of the detonation to describe each stage of the explosion to the user. Motion charts offer a new perspective on thyroid dosage and iodine-131 concentrations by allowing the user to compare one set of data to another in a visual and dynamic way. The resulting comparison can be depicted across all counties in the state, or a few can be highlighted for a more specified study. Each test shot has its own corresponding motion chart. In this example, we are looking at shot upshot not whole Harry, commonly referred to as Dirty Harry. We have chosen to have the size of the bubbles represent the average dose received by an adult female drinking milk from a cow in the household's backyard. Immediately, we can see women from counties in the southwest region of Utah have been drinking more milk from local cows and likely have been exposed to higher doses. On the y-axis, we are progressing through stages of fetal development from 11 through 20 weeks to 21 through 30 weeks, and finally ending at 31 through 40 weeks of gestation. In this comparison, you can see the strong parallel between the amount of local milk an average southern Utah woman drank and the resulting thyroid dose in a fetus. The cloud height diagrams are intended to show the scale of the mushroom clouds resulting from a nuclear test blast. One graphic has been created for each operation conducted at the Nevada test site. Cloud height measurements were obtained from a report by the U.S. Department of Energy. Although originally provided in meters, we've converted the units from meters to feet and displayed both in these graphics so users may observe both metric and imperial height measurements. To further demonstrate the sheer size of these mushroom clouds, we've included a scaled group of buildings each of which being, at one point in time, the tallest building in the world. These range from the Empire State Building in New York City to Burj Khalifa in Dubai. For those operations that resulted in larger mushroom clouds, we have also included the standard cruising range for a Boeing 757, approximately 30,000 feet to 42,000 feet. In addition, also included diagrams depicting the method by which humans are exposed to nuclear fallout and the resulting health effects fallout has on the human body. These are especially significant because they show how the majority of downwinders became exposed and the path by which fallout was absorbed into their system. These graphics also describe the symptoms the majority of downwinders experienced with respect to levels of radiation dosage. Historical events and publications comprise a considerable portion of the Downwinders of Utah archive, chronologically relaying information and events as they progress. Major events detailed include court cases related to victims and sheep ranchers with external links to official transcripts, testing ban treaties such as the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which later changed how nuclear testing was conducted by prohibiting all test detonations in the atmosphere, in space, or underwater while continuing to permit underground testing, as well as important government programs such as the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act created to compensate victims of nuclear exposure with official links, detailed information on qualified applicants, and geospatial visualizations breaking down counties eligible for compensation. Historical newspaper articles and additional documentation are also presented to relay information and statements provided to the public while documenting how government positions changed over time with respect to nuclear testing. These positions depict the initial government standing that there were no dangers associated with nuclear testing up to the 1980s when individuals with VALA ailments were officially recognized. Through the use of the search engine ProQuest, each article has been collected and chronologically presented, 
with a brief synopsis of the main points, a preview image of the original article, and a link for viewing the full article accessible through the J. Willard Marriott Library. The Atomic Energy Commission put extensive amounts of time and energy into presenting a positive image of itself and nuclear testing to the surrounding public. Brochures and public announcements were made describing the importance of American nuclear superiority and safety measures taken by the AEC during atomic testing. Residents of St. George and the surrounding areas were told they were a very real part of national defense through nuclear testing, a statement designed to spark their patriotism. While assuring civilians testing posed no danger, the AEC simultaneously admitted they had been exposed to potential risk from flash, blast, or fallout. During emergencies when the AEC determined it was unsafe for civilians to be outside, radio announcements were made telling everyone to stay indoors. Unfortunately, people were often away from their radio sets and regularly missed these rare warnings. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Due to a change in wind direction, the residue from this morning's atomic detonation is drifting in the direction of St. George. To prevent unnecessary exposure to radiation, it is better to take cover during this period. Parents need not be alarmed about children at school. No recesses outdoors will be permitted. There is no danger. This is simply routine safety procedure. In contrast with the AEC's reassuring radio broadcast, Frank Butrico, a serviceman responsible for monitoring levels of radioactivity, recounts the AEC's hesitance and reluctance to disclose the looming danger facing St. George after the Dirty Harry shot. I happened to look at my instrument and noticed that in the center of St. George, Utah, where I was located, the instrument was reading well over 300 to 350 millirankens per hour, which was just about the, the range of the instrument. Obviously, these were higher readings than the maximum permissible levels established by AEC on a national basis. Butrico notified the test site, but his records show almost an hour passed before he was told to issue a warning that the residents of St. George should take cover. It wasn't too much of a surprise that not everybody had the word. Cars were still on the road within St. George. People were still walking on the streets. And most distressing, when we passed in grade school, we noticed that the children were still on their morning recess, the teacher having not received the, the information about taking cover. I received instructions to be sure and discard my clothing and to be sure and keep showering until I reduced the amount of radiation that was on my body. I should point out that I did ask uh, whether we should be doing the same thing uh, in an announcement to people in the community. And of course the answer was a resounding no because uh, this would create a, a, a panic situation. In addition to public announcements, a number of organizations created propaganda films for school children centered on nuclear warfare. These films were tailored to specific age groups and told students what to do during a potential nuclear strike from the Soviet Union. No mention was ever made in these, or any, propaganda films of the dangers posed by the nuclear testing less than 140 miles away. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Atta boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running? He stays down until he is sure the danger is over. The man helping Tony is a civil defense worker. His job is to help protect us when there is danger of the atomic bomb. We must obey the civil defense worker. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing 
if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover! This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? As part of the Downwinders of Utah archive, a number of interviews are presented relaying information on Downwinders, nuclear testing, and how the government is making restitution to victims. In this excerpt, conducted at the University of Utah's J. Willard Marriott Library, Congressman Jim Matheson conveys his thoughts regarding the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, also known as RECA, while breaking down the program and his efforts to bring justice and compensation to downwinder victims. Ultimately, the tangible admission of the government that, that it lied and that it was at fault was when Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which is known as RECA. Uh, that happened before I got in Congress, but that was a very significant step in my opinion. And to me, it wasn't really about the monetary compensation. It was more about the admission that the government did something wrong. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I think it's important for the victims to have access to that compensation. When I first got in office, the challenge was that the fund was uh, underfunded, if you will. So people who were dying of cancer would make their application for compensation under RECA, and the government, in effect, gave them an IOU and said, well, we'll get back to you later, which was unconscionable, in my opinion. And so when I first got in Congress, the, the effort to make sure compensation victims, uh, I mean victims of the testing receive their compensation, that's the first thing I worked on in this issue. And uh, fortunately, the, the issue was so compelling. I mean, people in Congress said, wait a minute, we can't, we can't do this. We told these people we compensate them, you can't give them an IOU. And so uh, that issue did get resolved. But that was during my first term in Congress, that's what I was really active on. Yeah, so who qualified for this um, compensation? Was there certain districts that sure. were covered? Or? The way Congress designed RECA um, was uh, you qualified for it based on um, either geographic criteria. There were certain counties that uh, individuals have to prove they lived in during a certain time frame. Or, and also it's based on certain types of cancers. And certain cancers that are known as radiation form cause of cancers are on that list. Um, Beyond the downwinder compensation victims, there's also the, the uranium miners. They were also part of the Radiation Exposure and Compensation Act. Now, when that bill was written, of course, um, it was based on the best understanding of the issues at the time. It was a rather arbitrary list in terms of which counties were in and which counties were out. Um, and, and, and so there have been efforts since to expand the scope of RECA to, to more equitably address those who are victims of the, of the, of the testing. In addition to interviews such as these, a number of oral history interviews with downwinder victims, families, and advocates are presented, which play an important role within the Downwinders of Utah archive. As an example of how oral histories are presented, the following excerpt of an interview conducted as part of the KUED documentary, 30 Years to Justice, demonstrates how stories and experiences bring light to the history and events, while developing a deeper understanding of topics and events as well as the impacts they have within our communities. And I was sitting on my horse and I just had my leg cocked over the saddle just watching the feedback. And I turned and looked this way and there were some airplanes. I just followed them right along and went right over in here and, and I was looking right straight into them and all at once there was a great big flash and a, and a big mushroom cloud come up. And then, second or two later a big boom and I just went like that it was just just a big flash right over in there I'd mushroomed up and then it was spreading out you know just spreading out it was quite a big cloud and it was coming it came right over and some army personnel and they pulled right up to camp the side of us of course we come out inside the wagon and they said my golly you guys are in a hot spot here you got to get out of here get out of here. There was no way. We had that herd of sheep. We were on our way in. We were going this way towards Cedar to Lamb. We had a little tin roof wagon. And he says, get in that wagon and, and get under what cover you can. Through the archive website, viewers are able to access currently submitted interviews by selecting an individual's name, 
including a brief synopsis of the interview, a streaming audio or transcribed video file of the interview conducted, and a complete PDF transcript for review. Viewers also have the opportunity to record and share their story through the Archive website and become part of the Downwinders of Utah Archive and its growing number of stories and personal accounts. The Downwinders of Utah Archive has been created and designed to bring together information on Utah's nuclear history in a way that educates students and researchers of the impacts nuclear testing has had throughout Utah while simultaneously relaying the story of a dark time in our nation's history. Newer generations may be unaware of the devastation produced during this era, leading to the creation of a creative and educational tool for understanding the topic in greater depth. The archives focus on individuals, families, and areas that were impacted as a result of nuclear testing aids in understanding events in greater detail, while educating future generations in hopes that the mistakes of the past will never occur again. It's easy to say that nuclear testing conducted at the Nevada test site was performed in the name of national security, but to overlook the impacts those actions have had within our communities could easily result in the same mistakes being made again, a goal which the Downwinders of Utah Archive hopes to prevent. In a final excerpt from an interview with Congressman Jim Matheson, these points are emphasized through his statement about the future of Downwinders and nuclear testing in our country. Well, first of all, I think that what, what folks need to know is, is that there, there's not a test that's imminent, but you've got to remain vigilant. During my time in Congress, uh, there have been various efforts to develop new uh, nuclear weapons. The Bush administration had two particular nuclear weapons it was trying to develop. Um, then there was an effort to do a, uh, a, d a different type of test. It was known as Divine Strike was the name of the specific test. It was not with a nuclear weapon. It was with conventional explosives. But the tonnage was so large it could never replicate a, a conventional bomb. It was clearly an, a precursor for nuclear weapons testing. And my office actually uncovered the documents that showed that that's exactly what that test was intended to be. So, so at various times during my time in Congress, there have been efforts to move ahead with more nuclear weapons testing. And I, what I would tell anyone who lives downwind is, is that uh, you can never take it for granted. I mean, I'm not saying we should panic because there isn't a test that's going to happen right away. But there will always, over the years, be entities that want to move ahead with the new round of testing. And that's why we need to keep an eye on this issue. The Downwinders of Utah Archive is available for viewing at downwindersofutah.org. Please visit the website to view the archive in its entirety and learn how you can become part of the Downwinders of Utah Archive.